Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this ninth video on heart sounds, we'll wrap up our discussion of the aortic valve focusing on aortic regurgitation, which is also referred to as aortic insufficiency. These terms are used interchangeably. As a quick reminder, aortic regurg is one of two key diastolic murmurs you need to be familiar with, with the other being mitral stenosis, which is characterized by an opening snap out at the apex. We will compare and contrast these two again later on. The murmur of chronic aortic insufficiency is best heard radiating toward the left sternal border, and this reflects the direction of blood flow as a result of valvular insufficiency. With that brief background, let's launch our discussion. Here is the roadmap we'll be using. As you can see, I'm going to cover the material in order of relative importance rather than a traditional presentation. Our first stop will be the key physiologic consequences of aortic regurgitation. And these can be summarized in a word, volume overload. That's really two words, but let's stay focused. The key derivatives of widened pulse pressure, eccentric hypertrophy, and the hemodynamic curves are all predictable consequences of volume overload. So here are the first major set of derivatives focusing on the widened pulse pressure, which is simply the systolic minus the diastolic pressures. I include a normal value as less than 50 millimeters mercury, but this is hardly a black and white value. Regardless, your job is to recognize the wide pulse pressure as a major characteristic feature of aortic regurg. In fact, if they give you the blood pressure in a patient with a murmur, simply noting the wide pulse pressure should pretty much clue you into the diagnosis. So question one, why is the pulse pressure widened? To review, the pulse pressure can widen either as a result of increased systolic pressure, decreased diastolic pressure, or both. In the case of aortic regurg, both events occur, but as I highlight here, it is the increase in systolic pressure that is the main contributor to the widened pulse pressure. So why is that? As described, aortic regurg is associated with an increase in stroke volume, resulting from the regurgitant volume plus the LA volume. We'll see in a moment how the increased stroke volume causes an elevation in the systolic blood pressure. Before getting there, however, Although I do highlight the systolic contribution, the diastolic pressure is also diminished as a result of valvular insufficiency. So why does the increase in stroke volume cause a rise in systolic blood pressure? Answer, the limited compliance of the aorta. Although rubbery and elastic, the aorta has a finite capacity to accommodate the increased volume of blood. And from the compliance formula, if the compliance is fixed or at its limit, changes in blood volume must translate into changes in pressure. They won't ask you this per se, but it is easy to remember a key piece of information when we understand the physiologic principle. So an increase in stroke volume translates into an increase in pressure as a result of limited compliance, and this in turn translates into a widening of the pulse pressure. And this principle was previously highlighted in our discussion of anemia. In the anemic state, there is decreased oxygen delivery to the periphery, but especially muscle, which causes vasodilation through local mediators, reduced afterload, and thereby increased stroke volume. For reasons just discussed, the increased stroke volume results in a widened pulse pressure. This is a neat little crossover between cardiology and hematology. Moving on to the next consequence of volume overload, let's review the eccentric hypertrophy associated with aortic regurgitation. For purposes of simplicity, I like to envision the regurgitant volume as literally expanding the LV free wall in an eccentric manner. But truth told, eccentric hypertrophy more specifically refers to the increase in end diastolic volume associated with aortic regurg. And unlike the concentric hypertrophy associated with aortic stenosis, in eccentric hypertrophy, the LV chamber volume increases in size. So this becomes a major compare and contrast. Concentric hypertrophy in aortic stenosis versus eccentric hypertrophy in aortic regurg. Concentric hypertrophy has a thickened wall, while eccentric has an enlarged chamber. And again, for purposes of understanding, these are both adaptive responses. Concentric hypertrophy, as discussed in the aortic stenosis video, is an adaptive response to increased afterload. Eccentric hypertrophy is the adaptive response to volume overload. The ventricular compliance increases to accommodate the volume. In both instances, the goal of these responses are to maintain cardiac output. The other derivative they like to go after relates to the sarcomere and how it responds to the two hypertrophic states. Be familiar with the concept that sarcomeres are added in parallel with concentric hypertrophy versus being added in series with eccentric hypertrophy. 
The longer sarcomeres associated with eccentric hypertrophy simply reflect the startling forces associated with the increased and diastolic volume. I don't want to beat this to death any more than I already have, but the distinction between eccentric and concentric hypertrophy is easy test fodder for the NBME. And the last physiologic considerations of the regurgitant volume are assessed through our hemodynamic curves. You should be familiar with these by now. Pictured here is the cardiac cycle curve. We are asked to determine how this curve will be impacted by aortic regurgitation. Well, let's think about it. We have an arrow directed at the point where the valve should be closing. We also know the valve won't be closing normally and blood volume is going to leak from the expected location in the aorta back into the left ventricle. So how will that appear on the curve? The curve highlights two changes. The shape of the LV pressure curve is unchanged, albeit the y-axis will record higher systolic pressures. But the noteworthy feature is the steep decline in the diastolic pressures located on the aortic pressure curve. This isn't terribly sexy, but it makes sense if we focus on the pathologic lesion, insufficiency of the aortic valve, and assess where the wide pulse pressure will be displayed, i.e. the aorta. And just to digress and summarize for a moment, here are the four curves you need to know from the cardiac cycle. I know these are hard to see on this slide, but getting all the culprits on one page should help you realize this isn't rocket science. So we now know that aortic insufficiency evidences a steep decline in the aortic pressures. Mitral regurgitation shows a mid-systolic rise in the LA pressure correlating with that backflow of blood. Aortic stenosis shows the characteristic delay in valve opening, and mitral stenosis is characterized by a chronic elevation in the LA pressure curve with narrowing of the A2 to opening snap ratio. Four lesions, four curves. Get to work on this stuff. It will save you a lot of headaches come test day. So although we just reviewed the cardiac cycle curves, when it comes to aortic regurge hemodynamics, you are more likely to see the LV pressure volume loop. It has a nuttier appearance with a greater variety of confusing labels, so of course they're going to like that curve better. And here is the pressure volume loop. From previous discussions, we like to start our assessments at end diastolic volume as labeled. So based on our understanding of aortic insufficiency and the regurgitant volume, we should be able to construct the aortic regurge curve. We know there is an increase in end diastolic volume, so the volume curve moves along the x-axis toward higher volumes. So far, so good. Next, we know as a result of valvular incompetence that the end systolic volume must also be increased. This just makes sense. Remember, this curve is the left ventricle. Blood is pouring back into it through the regurgitant valve. So we have an increased end systolic volume as well as an increased end diastolic volume. So that leaves us with the stroke volume represented by the area within the curve. From earlier discussion, we know that the stroke volume is increased in this volume overload state, and this is reflected in the curve. So this is what the aortic insufficiency curve will look like. And here comes another compare and contrast. Aortic insufficiency is associated with an increase in diastolic volume, but so is dilated cardiomyopathy. How will the curves differ? And whereas dilated cardiomyopathy has an increase in diastolic volume, or preload, the stroke volume is diminished, so there shouldn't be any confusion between the two curves or conditions. And that is it for the physiologic consequences. We covered the pulse pressure as related to fixed aortic compliance, eccentric hypertrophy, especially compared with concentric hypertrophy, and the two graphics that might be displayed, including the cardiac cycle and the pressure volume loop. Let's breeze through the remaining easy stuff, including the physical exam and demographics. Then we can get the hell out of here. All right, let's come back to the murmur and how it will be presented. By now we know it is a diastolic murmur that radiates to the left sternal border, and it is associated with a wide pulse pressure. I've listed the differential diagnosis of murmurs at the left sternal border, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we've already reviewed, and VSD. These are both systolic murmurs with unique demographics and characteristics. There shouldn't be any confusion. And to review, for the last time ever, here are the differences between mitral stenosis and aortic insufficiency, which are the two major diastolic murmurs. AI has no snap, does have a wide pulse pressure with a different location and set of hemodynamic. The only remote overlap is with rheumatic fever, and even this is a stretch. Mitral stenosis is a late complication of repeated bouts of rheumatic fever. On the other hand, acute rheumatic valvulitis may present with aortic insufficiency. Just keep this nugget in the back of your mind. But on this distinction between mitral stenosis and aortic insufficiency, I do have one other treat. 
the Austin Flint Murmur. This bad boy occasionally pops up in the Q-Banks, but it's not a major derivative for the NBME. I include this because it can muddy the waters when distinguishing aortic regurgitation from mitral stenosis. The murmur itself is described as an apical diastolic murmur secondary to the regurgitant jets directed at the left ventricular free wall. An apical rumbling diastolic murmur. Damn, that sounds a lot like mitral stenosis. By necessity, this murmur will need to be distinguished from mitral stenosis by the company it keeps, including pulse pressure and other hemodynamic information, plus the absence of an opening snap. That's just another nugget of information brought to you by 12 days. Keep Austin Flint in the deep recesses of your mind when considering aortic insufficiency. I need to include this quote by the good Dr. Flint himself. So long as signs are determined from fancied analogies and named from these or after the person who describes them, there cannot but be obscurity and confusion. I totally agree. You gotta respect this guy. Except I'm not digging those sideburns. All right. Here at the end of our presentation is the usual phonographic recording of the aortic insufficiency murmur coming immediately after S2 in a decrescendo pattern. Mitral stenosis with its opening snap is shown for comparison. Big whoop, you already know this stuff. And finally, in what set of patients can you expect to hear about aortic insufficiency and the derivative issues? Here are the main players. Endocarditis, characterized by new murmur in a febrile high-risk patient. Acute rheumatic valvulitis, as previously mentioned, will be another setup. A dilated aortic root and or the predisposing conditions are a further setup for aortic regurgitation questions. Generally speaking, however, the pathology of the underlying condition, such as syphilis, will predominate the discussion. The diastolic murmur is included to clue you in. And finally, the number one answer from our studio audience on when you should suspect aortic regurgitation. And the answer is... Widen pulse pressure. So it turns out all of these signs of aortic insufficiency that I had to memorize for the internal medicine boards a hundred years ago just reflected the pulse pressure issues that we've beaten to death for hours. Good luck in your internal medicine boards. Quinky's pulse indeed. I know you're saying, Sax, leave us alone. We don't want bonus thoughts. We're tired. You've worn us down. Okay, then stop the recording. But for those of you who are interested in these QBank favorites, stick with me. The boards does love atrial fibrillation. They can do a lot with it as discussed in earlier videos. But the one tried and true derivative that they keep coming back to is the fast heart rate, which interferes with left ventricular filling. In a patient with aortic insufficiency, who is dependent on that preload to maintain cardiac output, what do you think will happen if they go into fast AFib? Correct, congestive heart failure. They can't maintain adequate cardiac output and they develop CHF. This is an easy one, applied pharmacology. If you have a leaky valve and you want to optimize cardiac output, how do we do it? Inotropes, negative chronotropes, reduce preload or reduce afterload? And you can see the answer is to reduce afterload. This is in top secret stuff. Reducing afterload, usually with an ACE inhibitor, improves the forward fraction, just like we see in mitral regurgitation. This is the mainstay of therapy. This is totally stupid and a total QBank useless fact, but I need to keep my conscience clear. Our discussion of volume overload in aortic regurgitation assumes the patient has chronic valvular insufficiency and is compensated. Acute aortic insufficiency in the setting of dissection is a different entity being nearly fatal as the heart has no capacity to adapt to the volume overload state. As such, we aren't talking about blood sloshing back toward the left sternal border. The diastolic murmur of acute aortic insufficiency is, in fact, heard over the aortic region or right upper sternal border. This is totally useless and not really step one board fodder, but we need to maintain integrity. And that is it. Here we are back at the roadmap. I hope you can appreciate how we sequence the topics. It was all juicy stuff, but the physiologic consequences are the most likely to be tested. As with other valvular heart disease, they assume you will be able to identify the murmur when presented. The demographics are included just for fun, and goodness knows we had fun. And that'll do it for the aortic valve. You guys are wearing me down. You can take aortic valves off your bucket list. Congratulations. If you have any questions or concerns about any of the material presented, please contact me at 12 days. Thank you.